So I guess we might as well kick off. Nobody wants to leave now before they shut the doors? All right. All right, good morning. Uh, my name's Andrew Kosmodakis. You can see up there, commonly known as COS for partially obvious reasons. Um, I'm a principal infrastructure consultant based out of Wellington for Intergym. I'm also a Microsoft VTSP and private cloud and optimized desktop, um, which is just a fancy name saying sales pony. Um, what I want to do is cover off um, some of the new features that are coming in IIS 8. Um, everybody attended the keynote yesterday? So you heard that um, as of this morning, actually as of about an hour ago, Microsoft launched globally um, Windows Server 2012 for general availability. New Zealand being the first, so we had Brad Burroughs sitting upstairs and um, talking about it and launching it to the world. So right now everybody across the Twitter sphere is talking about Server 2012 being launched. Microsoft has officially launched it, so it's available now for download and use. So hopefully after today, or well this week, you guys will be able to go out and start playing with some of the goodness that's coming out with 2012, including some of the stuff I'll show you today and some of the other speakers we'll be showing you throughout the next few days. So just as a quick session overview, what I'm hoping you guys will get out of today, um, I want to show you guys how to secure your websites, how to host more secure websites, so increasing the density of your servers. Also how to ease some of the administration of um, some of the common tasks that happen within IIS and also how to use some of the new features including sandboxing applications. So there's nothing worse than an application running away and taking down your server and causing other issues for um, any other application running. So the key takeaway really is how to manage certificates, uh, dynamic IP restrictions, so securing your servers a bit more, CPU throttling, which is the sandboxing, and also using server name indicator to using some of the scaling of the SSL pieces. A lot of these features are new to Server 2012, and also some of the features will be available for download for previous version of um, IIS. Has anybody sparked up 2012 yet? Okay, one couple, okay. You install the web server roles, like most people? No, not yet. You do pretty much what you were doing the other day, previous day of Server 20, 2008? Yeah, a lot of people do that. They'll spark up, the, spark up a new operating system, add the features and roles that they had previously, and just start working with it like they did the previous time. I, in the past, used to do that quite often. Um, so what happens when we start to look at these new um, servers and features that are available to us, we need to sort of pay a bit more attention to what's further down in the, underneath the hood. And with IIS, and particularly web services role, you tick it, you tick all the other authentication, basic authentication, Windows authentication, anything else you might need, and you move on, and you start doing things the way you're doing them today. If you look deeper into some of the roles and features within IIS 8, you will actually see that there's quite a few hidden features that are in, within there. We're talking about shared certificates, we're talking about shared configuration, we're talking about IP, dynamic IP filtering, all these different um, options that are there for you. They can actually benefit and help scale your servers actually provide you a bit more security and ease the administration you've got to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So from a security perspective, when it comes down to securing our websites, of course the internet's such a safe place, nobody's out to harm your web servers. So you can put them out there and you might put them behind a firewall or a load balancer and you leave them out there and, hey, we'll enable logging, let's see who's connecting. Under IS 7 we had static IP restrictions. This meant that if I, somebody was trying to do anything malicious to my server, I had to sit down and troll through the logs and determine what was going on. And if anybody was causing me any issues or doing anything suspicious, I would then have to start um, adding those client IP addresses to an exception list and blocking them at that point. I was only able to offer them an HTTP 403 error, which would then say, hey, you're forbidden. You're not actually allowed to access this website anymore. IS8 offers us the dynamic ability to be able to restrict access for malicious um, use of our websites. I can actually customise what's going on and also customise the responses that's, happening, that's being relayed back. If I want to give the hacker, script kitty, a 401 response, a 403 response, a 404 response or an abort response, I can pick which error I want. I can actually do that at a server-wide layer, or I can actually base it down to a site-by-site -site layer to say, hey, 
If you're accessing this site, I'm going to tell you that, hey, you're not, the file's not found. But if you're accessing this site, it's going to be forbidden. The, one of the features that comes with IIS 8 and the dynamic IP restrictions is the ability to actually, for the, soft, for the server software, to actually be proxy aware. So if I am living behind a firewall or an NLB or anything along those lines, and we start getting malicious attacks against our server, the ability to actually look at the x dash uh, header forward, forward a header, sorry, and actually interpret where the client IP address is. So rather than blocking what's happening at my, IP, at my firewall and blocking access from my firewall to my server, blocking it right back down to the client level where it originated from. And again, this is also a downloadable option for IS 7.5. So if you're running 2008 R2 today, you can actually start adding some of these features straight onto your servers. Um, pretty much following the same stance as IIS and web services, we've also got the FTP um, static IP filtering. Again, you used to have to sit down and troll through your logs if somebody was trying to do a brute force attack on your server. Anybody running um, FTP anymore? Yeah, one, two, cool. So having you know, a brute force attack, everybody's coming in as an administrator, trying to hack it, using password lists and dictionaries to go through. A lot of this is skip kit, script kitty stuff, and the basic people will be trying to do it. Normally, if there's a number of attempts that try to flood your um, FTP service, your service might hang, it might stop, it might stop responding completely. So what we're doing is saying, well, if the client IP address is the same every time, or this number of client IP addresses are coming through the same, trying to authenticate and having failed logins to my server each time, block them as well, get rid of them, but still allow access for people that are actually trusted. I can say, all right, this half of the room, attack the website. This half of the room, just access it normally, or the FTP server, sorry. Come through normally. And you guys will be able to access it while the rest of you are getting blocked because of the num number of attempts you're taking on to it. Okay, where are we going? All right. Of course, this screen switches off just as I go to use it. All right. <coughs> So what I'm going to do is quickly show you guys just how dynamic IP restrictions can be used. Um, I've got a simple uh, chaos monkey here. I apologize for the resolution. Um, and what it's going to do is fire about 600 denial of service attacks at a website for me. So I've got a couple of VMs running on my machine here, and that's going to just replicate a denial of service attack in the case of a production environment. Just as a point to note, I've got 600 zombies there, and they fire off about one every second. Um, under Windows Server 2012, uh, sorry, 2008 and 2008 R2, at about 100, I could actually Kuma the box. It would drop the box and make, render it useless. I couldn't access any resources. I couldn't run up Task Manager. I can't really do a lot with it. To actually start degrading the performance of my um, IS8 Server 2012 box, I actually had to reduce the server to its minimum re uh, requirements. So it's only got half a gig of memory, so the box starts to really play up and I've got to fire 600 to 800 zombies to actually start degrading the performance of the server. So hopefully it will degrade, but it won't degrade too badly for us today. Um, so that's starting to show some of the, the features and the, the stability of Server 2012 already. So we've just got standard IS. I have... FTP services and dynamic IP restriction enabled on the server, and it's just your standard IIS console. These, all these options can be scripted, of course, if you need to. And if I have a look at the um, dynamic IP restriction settings, I can start to alter some of the options that I've got available. If I've, I can create a client exception or allow list, and I can actually turn around and say, okay, unspecified clients are allowed access to the site, or I can deny or... Um, access to the site. So if there is a, um, a hosted solution that you're running and you've got internal and external network connectivity to that box, we can actually allow all the internal networks to access the website and, and deny them at the external level. Again, proxy mode for allowing it behind filtering, uh, firewalls or filters. And then the different type of deny, um, deny action types. What I'm going to do is just pick unauthorized, which is pretty standard. And then we've got the actual feature itself. I can deny access to this website on a malicious attack based on the number of concurrent connections 
or the number of HTTP requests over a specific time, um, time period. I can set it to one second, I can set it to 20 minutes if I need to. The difference we've got to make sure here is, in a demo purpose, I'm setting them everything quite low. This will require some testing in a production environment, so run it through a proper development environment, of course. Last thing you want to start denying all your customers access to your web services. So in the case here, I'm going to just turn on concurrent connections. I'll just let this baby sit for a bit. And switch back to my chaos monkey. At this point here, I'll just start ramping up the zombies. So I can start accessing the website. This is just an expense manager application that was created for Microsoft Redmond for, to demonstrate some of the private cloud functionality that's available. So it doesn't do too much. So as you can see straight away, the zombies have ramped up. I've hit over my five concurrent connections. I've gone to refresh the page and I'm actually being denied. So this is set at the server layer. I can set different policies at a top layer of the server or different policies overriding some of the server layer um, settings at the website layer itself. So I could say, well, five concurrent connections at this layer, but I'd want different error messages for different websites. Again, all this information can be logged. So if you want to just enable logging mode only and sit there and capture this information, you can. So I'll turn this off now. connectivity will be resumed, but it'll probably start degrading a bit because I'm getting hammered now with zombies. So while that tries to recover. Does anybody, has anybody got the unfortunate job of actually having to troll through their IS logs? Yeah, it's a hard one, eh? Yeah, it's time consuming. Annoying, the whole nine yards. Yeah, true. So straight away, something like this can actually help you in your day-to-day -day job by actually just going, well, look, I can dynamically block it. I can log this information as well if I need to. All of this is logged continually. And if I need to start denying people by default rather than allowing them access, you can. So you can start grabbing that information out of the logs and applying them to a deny list straight away and then blocking them that way if they keep coming back. Yeah, they're not going to get anything straight off, off your servers. Is anybody responsible for managing the, the certificates on their servers? You love it when your certificates expire in the morning and you're on your way to work? Yeah, we all do. So with um, IIS 7, as we all know, the uh, certificates are bound to the web instance, the IIS instance. We've got our websites, we assign a certificate, we have to load them up onto the server manually. We can either script them up, of course, or we can use the um, MMC console to replace the certificates. Under IIS, the IIS 8, we've introduced a new feature called Centralized Certificate Store. What this is, at the end of the day, is a UNC path living within your environment where you're storing all your certificates. You're actually putting your certificates on a file share. All your certificates, are, as your websites are getting requested, they're looking into this file share, they're pulling up the certificate that is relevant for their website and loading it into memory. That's the one thing to note as well, is that everything under Windows 2012 around certificates and IIS, they're loaded on demand. So certificates are not automatically loaded just because you've restarted IIS. Each time the certificate is required, it loads it into memory and keeps it in memory until you restart your server or you restart IIS. To test the, um, the scale of what the memory footprint of this is, just start firing some get um, HTTP requests at your server and you'll see your certificates getting loaded up. The um, footprint, extremely minimal. Ooh, go back a bit. So certif centralized certificate stores are really a copy and paste replacement of your certificates. So if you've got a certificate that expires, literally copy and paste it. You know, of course, you've got to go through your issuing process. There is, you can't bypass that. We can't automate that for you for too much. Um, and you literally just copy and paste it into file share. A polling interval runs in the background of IIS, and it will go away and refresh your certificates based on the hash values of all your certificates. And we'll walk through that one shortly.
Now, sort of fitting into the uh, SSL space is the server name indicator. We know a number of web servers out there can already do this feature, but now built into Windows Server 2012 is the, name to, is the way to actually assign SSL certificates against websites based on their DNS name or host names. Of course, this feature was not supported under IIS 7, and it is supported under IIS 8. This starts to allow us to actually add greater density to our IIS instances. So in the case of a lot of people, how many people have tried hosting more than one SSL site on a web server? A lot of fluffing around, port redirections, based on this name, you know, how many people are using 8443 as another option? You know, it's a pretty common stuff that we're trying to get everything through. What they've done is we've taken TLS and we've extended it. All it is is adding additional features within the, uh, the protocol, allowing us to actually identify a server based on its DNS name, but then match it to the certificate and the host header name that we're actually applying to the site. So I'll quickly do a run through of the certs. So one point to note, it is a private key, public key matchup between the, um, the certificate stores. So you do have to get your conversion process right and making sure that your public key, private keys are actually married up. So you issue your CER file, do the conversion process, and literally copy and paste them. Now, just on the controller server here that I've got, I've just got a file share. The first two certificates that you can see are actually running on the web server that, we've been, that I'll be walking through as we're going through. The services one is just a secondary server that I've got. It's a mid-tier server, and that's using the same repository to pull the same, its certificate that it requires. The catch, notice the names of the servers. When I start typing them into the browser, it's actually the FQDN or the DNS name that you're using is how they're married up. And this is going to use the server name indicator layer to actually marry up those servers, those certificates as well. So that's the one little gotcha. Clicking too much. Okay. So as you can see here, we've loaded it's IS has gone off, it's looked at the share which is authenticated to via a service account. I'll show you the config in a second. And it's looking at all the certificates that it can enumerate within that share. So in the case here, we've only got three. So it looks at the issued to name. It's got the issuer date, sorry, issued by, so in my in case, my internal CA, and the expiry period, as you can see, this is expired, and the certificate hash values. That's where it's comparing what certificates are required and when it needs to load what certificates, or if they've changed and it needs to refresh the certificate in memory. So if I have a look here, I can browse these things as you can within the normal MMC console and viewing your certificate information. Of course, if I was to do this via Explorer, being a PFX file, I have to import it first, then assign it, and then I can actually start viewing the properties of it. Within the IIS environment, it already knows the certificate and passes the, the proper metadata back to you. So in the case here, I've got a nice certificate that has expired. Nice and simple. There's actually two of them. So we have a look at the feature settings. I've just got a UNC path that I'm pointing to. It's a share. It's a viewable share. I should have made it hidden, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> and I've got a service account that's got full access to that share. I've restricted everybody else, bar my domain admins, of course, and entered this service account user ID and password. If you have a look down below, optional is depending on how your certificates are set up and you're exporting your private key, um, public key information, you may have to put in a, um, your private key password for this. So in the case here, all my passwords have had to be identical on those, all those certificates. So it's a better matter of standardizing some of the things in your environments as well. And it's going away, looking at all of them, interpreting the certificates, pulling the information it needs, and then just holding and holding fire pretty much.
So once this thing catches up, so we're all used to seeing that at some point in time. It's worse than when it's for us in the mornings. And our users start complaining about it. Can you guys see the data that appears? Yeah, that's all right. Don't have to zoom in or anything. So again, the exact same certificate that I was looking at before from this web server itself is being replicated here back at the client layer, as you would expect. In a multi-server web farm, having a centralized certificate store allows me to update certificates once. So I copy them into the location it needs, point all my servers to it, which is PowerShell, registry key changes, and you can actually apply it. It's nice and simple and automatable. And all your servers across a SharePoint farm or any other farm that you're running will actually talk to that repository and load the required certificates that they need. Therefore, one point of update. We don't have to worry about changing anything after that. Yeah, you can have, it's, think about it from a day-to-day -day perspective. You're not, not going to issue certificates for your entire environment on one day. So over a period of time, you're going to keep updating it. it yeah. You what, sorry? Yeah. What, in the case of here, you'd actually just replace the certificate. So if you've got a new certificate, you copy it over and replace what's there. There's no point having a certificate that's going to expire. It won't actually look at it from perspective of, you know, some people may have a business reason, that's absolutely fine. But in the case of this feature, it is a matter of you replace it, it becomes available straight away. It is an instant apply within a polling interview, of course, so it's sort of instant. Yeah. So by default, IS will poll every five minutes looking for any certificate changes. You can change that setting to be whatever you need it for your business requirements. In the case of here, I've set it to the minimum value, which is one minute. So you're going to have to listen to me ramble a little bit longer for one minute while those changes apply. So while we're talking about that, I'll quickly show you guys the server name might indicate a stuff. Um, we're being able to marry up SSL with host and virtual directory names to offer more uh, scalable SSL sites within your IS instances. And of course, from an SS, uh, SNI perspective, it's about getting one IP address responding. So in the case here, my server's only got one IP address. I'm getting multiple websites with multiple different DNS names, all responding off the same IP address, but offering different certificates and different um, information back to the uh, end users. So all it is is a checkbox. Check I tell it that, hey, you have to check that the host name or the DNS name that's coming that it's been requested is matched up. Therefore, match up the SSL site to that request. And that was what gets passed back to the end user at the end of the day. And again, everything's listening on port 443. If I go back to another site with some security on it, you'll see the exact same information is applied there. Same IP address, same port number, just a different host name. And again, I've told this to use the centralized certificate store. So this is looking off at the UNC path to gather the information that it requires for certificates. One thing to note, actually, is if I've got SS, um, the centralized certificate store enabled on my top layer, IIS layer, I don't have to use centralized certificate stores for every website. I can have websites using the traditional binding method, or I can say, all right, individual websites, I want you to use this path, I want you to use that path. So you can get quite granular in some of the features, some of the way you handle your certificates if you want, if you have a business requirement to be able to handle it differently. For some government customers, the GCSB may require that you have different approach to how you handle it. And is this refreshed yet? There we go. So now we've got valid certificates at least. Cool. So all those hash, the certificate hashtags have actually been updated now. IS is going to look into the store, realize that those hashtags have changed, 
and actually reload the certificates back into memory for me. If I close this bad boy now, it's a horrible yellow, I know. The demo gods love me, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Ah, it's always the case, isn't it? Come on, wakey, wakey. Ah, oh, well. There's no love in this world anymore with products. Yeah, that's better. It's taking a bit longer now. So well, technically what this should be doing in the background, which it did not do, we'll move on from that anyway, is actually look into the store on the and actually update it for me. The fact that IAS is seeing that certificate is a good start, but unfortunately the client doesn't want to uh, pass that information back down for it. So hopefully if the refresh interval kicks in, I'll come back to it in a second. Okay. Now we talk about the ability to be able to scale your servers. Around allowing resources to be available for different types of applications or services within that environment. So when we have applications that are handed over to us, we, as IT administrators, we deploy them. We trust that they've been tested. We trust that they're well written. Unfortunately, there are times when you do get a problematic application. That problematic application can then cause issues for good applications that are running within your environment. You may have a sales application that's running and that starts causing issues for your finance team. Under IS7, the CPU throttling allowed us to actually restrict the amount of issues that were happening on a server, the amount of CPU that was being taken, consumed by, this, um, by IIS. Unfortunately, it monitored at an entire server layer. It monitored CPU based on the entire server's CPU load. At the end of the day, if this, the only configurable option we had was to terminate IIS. So it would actually restart IIS on us, terminating the actual um, instance that was running, allowing it to restart and start consuming lower amounts of resources. This is really good from an IT admin perspective because at the end of the day, our server's healthy, it's staying up, and we're able to have a server that's meeting some sort of uh, reliability status. From a user perspective or a customer's perspective, especially if you're a hoster or offering external websites, this wasn't good. Your customers need to be able to access your websites. Your application needed to be available, but you're, ter you're terminating it because your application is actually consuming too many resources. So it's that balance between IT administration and customer service. IS8 now, with CPU throttling, actually offers us a lot more granularity. We can actually offer, uh, we can actually restrict the CPU based on tenant. Is everybody aware of the whole concept of the multi-tenanting in IIS and Windows Server 2012 multi-tenancy? It's about getting more applications and services onto your box without affecting or cross-pollinating cross with each other. At the end of the day, it's, you're adding more websites in an IIS instance. But we want to make sure that the, the performance of one application or service doesn't impact the other. And this is where the multi-tenancy part of I, uh, Server 2012 is actually giving us that granularity. We can start to say, all right, the CPU threshold, well, it's actually based on the worker process now. We're actually monitoring the individual worker processes for each of those applications or services. And that includes the application pool information. We're actually looking at options. We can actually set options like, okay, if the entire server is busy, then do this. If it's just this website that's consuming resources, then do this. We actually have a number of additional options now. We can say, throttle, the, throttle that application or service. Throttle the, serv throttle the application or service based on the load of the server, which takes us back to the IA7 features. Or we can turn around and say, kill the W3, uh, P, W3WP process. 
In other words, giving us the same thing, or just leave it alone. Let the box run away and do what it's doing, and hopefully it will recover. So <clears throat> there's nothing worse than having these problematic applications start to starve at good applications and taking the resources that we need to offer quality of service back to our customers. If you're a, ho if you're a hosting customer, this is quite critical. And that could be, I'm just hosting a website externally. It doesn't have to be a hosting application or a hosting person that's looking after it. We're typically talking about just getting applications out there to the users. Also, what happens if you have the, got the sales and the finance team on the same server? They argue about having to pay for, your, for services within your organization, so you want to increase the density on your servers. You add more websites or more applications to these servers. So you need to make sure that you're not impacting other departments who may be paying for the kit, and another department's just leveraging that, that environment and that equipment. So what I'll do is I'll run through the CPU throttle and see if the certificates have gone updated itself now. And has it? Yay! <laughs> and in a great few minutes, uh, the one minute polling interview, interval, we've now got the new certificates sitting on the server. And that was done with nothing more than a copy and paste of the new certificates into the central store. So of course now it's loaded into memory, I can now access it and my website just functions as it should before. One thing to note about the CPU throttling is it may not be something that you're looking at today. It may be something that you want to keep in the back of your mind, or it may end up being a situation where you actually have to apply it on the fly. It is a setting that does get applied live. It won't restart IIS on you. So if you actually have a, web, a website that is constantly causing you problems throughout a day, you can actually go and apply that option, if you're running Server 2012, of course, on the fly, apply the, um, the thresholds that you want to set, apply the action that you want to set and let it go. And then straight away, within a couple of minutes, and based on my demo experience, it ain't going to be a couple of minutes, it's going to drop everything down to the, to the CPU settings that you're actually telling it to do. And again, it's for those worker processes. So when you start seeing runaway worker processes, these can be applied on the fly. So by default, it's one one thousandth of a percent, so which is perfect for when we're you know, in a rush. Um, and we're taking no action. We've got no limits, so zero is we're not saying, we're not applying any limits to any of our worker processes, and we're actually just saying, just let it go. So right now I can hit my server and let the CPU processes just run out of control, and that's what we're gonna bring up Task Manager. And for the purposes of this demo, I'm just let you know, is I'm actually gonna be running over HTTP, it's a lot easier to see what's going on under an HTTP environment around the worker processes. When we enable HTTPS and CPU throttling, it actually gets all encapsulated in LSA and then follows through to the worker processes. So you actually start to see five or six different things happening and for a demo purpose, it's actually harder to actually show you guys, here's what the process is happening, here's how it's applying, here's what's happening in the rules. So we're not avoiding HTTP, HTTPS, we're just showing HTTP on the pure fact that it's easier. second page to light up. Okay, so in the case here, I've got two different applications running within the same IIS instance. Both of them are running on port 80 and port 443, using all the features I've been talking about so far. And at the end of the day, I'm going to just start doing a denial of service attack on this primary website here. I want to show you guys how the CPU is just going to start spiking out, start maxing out, start consuming all the resources on my server. 
the, the secondary application can run fine for a while and then eventually you're going to start getting degraded performance and it's actually going to cause us more of an issue than anything. So we're going to show how CPU throttling then works into it by allowing us to then scale out other applications and leave those applications running while restricting our bad app. And in this place, sorry, switch back. Get the zombies going. So straight away, we're going to see the IIS worker process start to kick in. That first worker process that I've highlighted is the primary website. That's Expense Manager itself. Expense Manager 2 has now sparked off its own IIS worker process and living in the background. Not much is happening in there, and it's just ticking away nicely. We start to see the CPU start to max out, drop down a bit, try to handle it. Windows is trying to actually control what's going on here. But unfortunately, we can't. We can... Eventually this box is going to become unstable and I'm not going to be able to use it too well again because I've restricted all the resources on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I don't want this app pool or this website to take over more than 40% of the CPU. And if I do, and if it does, throttle it. I want to throttle the experience that's going on with that website. So on the fly now, I've applied that change. And we're going to start to see that the worker processes... Are going to get, we get initial uh, worker processes, a new worker processes get kicked into life, and IS transfers the roles from one worker process to another worker and starts to restrict it around the 40% mark. It's never going to be exactly 40%, it always hovers over and above. You know, sometimes you get it up to 50%, but it drops back down to around the 40% mark. And we can see there we're holding it at about 40% now, and I can actually switch back to the other client. and just start to get a bit of a throttled experience. As you can see, the secondary website, which I've got no, no throttling or restrictions applied to, loaded normally. This one's still thinking about it, still running the donut at the top, it's still gathering some of the data and checking all the data in the background and passing it back to the client and the, 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 client and the user. And it's still thinking. And in the background, we're still sitting around that 40% mark with the worker process. Sorry? They're not absolute percentages. It's based on, site, on the percentage of time. So, the one, so what it's doing is saying, okay sorry, not time, CPU usage. So it's at more of an average than anything else, and it keeps it around the 40% mark. So I can't see nothing else is busy, just give it 100%. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of, sorry, but have a chat to me afterwards. I'll see what I can dig up for you, actually. I hadn't thought about that one. And what, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's across virtual machines and services, though, isn't it? Yeah. 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 No, come and grab me afterwards. I'll see what I can dig up for you. Okay. So what I'll do now is I'll kill the zombies and we'll just watch the CPU fall back into place. Right, what I want to do is quickly just wrap up a few things, and what I want to do is just give you guys some, some experiences from the field. We've been working with um, Server 2012 now for about nine months and using it in quite a few different type of demonstration environments, application environments, and um, deployments, to be honest. And there's a whole bunch of th tri tri yeah, things that have tripped us up while we've been going that actually it took us to go to the product team to get a few things sorted. And with the product team, we've sat down and said, well, these are quite a, quite a few common things that need to happen, and these are quite a few common things that we do within a normal organisation. So I want to offer you guys some of the tips that we learnt along the way from the field. So centralised certificate store, 
It is enabled via IIS Manager, as you saw, or you can do it via PowerShell. So therefore offering you a little bit more flexibility in how you do it and also a repeatable process to be able to deploy it across multiple servers within your organization. It's just straight simple. Enable Web Central Cert Provider. And of course, everybody goes looking for that. Um, like I mentioned, the default polling interval is five minutes. Um, haven't come across anything with um, there's a limit on how often it polls. I guess it's a time thing. Um, the lowest limit you can go to is one minute. And of course, certificates are loaded in memory every time the website is requested. Has anybody here used the Web Deploy or MS Deploy web kits? All right, cool. It's a better experience than most time when we talk about it. Um, for those who don't use it, Web Deploy is really um, a simplified deployment mechanism for IAS. So being able to deploy your pages, your scripts, and everything across your organization from environment to environment quite simply. Um, the simplified, it gets so simple that you can actually get your developers to pump them directly out of Visual Studio into what they call a um, deploy package. The deploy package at the end of the day is a fancy zip file where, you know, pretty much like all our office documents and things of today. If you have a look into it, all it is is the directory structure. But there's a lot of metadata that's stored within that um, directory structure to allow it to remember the path that you want to go to. So if there's a common path that you deploy to, say, I don't know, CIIS, my website. It will remember that information. You can override that information with command lines. So it's a simple command line tool. You actually pass the command line, and you can overwrite where you're, where you're moving that website to. So if you're going to do through a staging environment before you go to full-blown production, you can actually overwrite that, then rerun the script again without that command line and actually overwrite what's there today. The package is smart, the deployment kit is smart enough that it actually looks into whatever existing website you have on, a, on your server, also within the MS Deploy package, and actually detect any changes that are required. So replace the files that it only needs to, or synchronize the files that you need to. If somebody's gone and edited a file on your web server to resolve an issue in production that you don't see in any other environment, it won't go away and necessarily replace that file. You can actually get it to prompt you, almost like a what if in PowerShell. The other thing is it does handle ASP.NET and PHP 2, which is quite cool. Um, and it is the native deployment package or custom resource type uh, built into Virtual Machine Manager 2012. Um, for those who automate uh, their website creation, anybody into that? I prefer to do repetitive. No. Nah. Okay. The SSL flag 3 that you can see on that second to last line, that is enabling centralized certificate store. Um, it's not very clear in the app CMD f uh, file right now. I haven't checked in RTM, to be honest. And then we, what we do is we apply that, and then you're using NetSSH Net to bind the um, S certificate store to those websites. It's quite a simple command. A lot of people who are doing the automation will know those, that command. It's the SSL flag that's the difference. Be pound, sorry? Yeah, it will be available after this. Hopefully they sanitize my uh, comments. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully today I've shown you, been able to show you guys some of the new features that are in IIS 8 with Server 2012, which again is available as of today. Some of these things will help you with uh, re uh, re reduce the amount of administration time you need to do some of this common and simple tasks within your environment. Also offer you a lot more security and protection from any malicious people out in the net or even within your organization. Some people do it for you know, may not realize that they're hammering your website because they're just impatient. F5, F5, what the hell's going on here? You can actually start to enable that dynamically and you know, allow your other users to continue normally. So thanks for listening, guys, and hopefully you gathered something out of that. I'm just <laughs> just on a bit of a side note, um, the, tomorrow, 4.30, I think it is, yep, one of the gentlemen I work with, Bevan Sinclair, is presenting on monitoring applications with System Center 2012. Anybody using System Center uh, Operations Manager in their environment? Cool. This is about managing the end-to-end -end life cycle and mo uh, monitoring and availability of your application. There's some quite cool demonstrations on code and everything and how you can get it back to your developers and start to resolve issues at a specific level. 
Um, the exams for Server 2012 are going to be announced soon. I'm not sure 100% which one it is, but there's nothing really specific to IAS, of course. Um, my email address above, if you've got any questions, feel free to contact me. My Twitter handle, I'm not much of a Twitterer, so um, if you want to be bored, you can follow me. Um, we'll go from there. Don't forget to fill out your registrations, check out the hub downstairs, and of course the general Microsoft resources available to you on TechNet and everything. So thank you very much.